Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the uh, Delphi Economic Forum. Um, our discussion will be on immigration in Europe. With me in the studio is Myra Mirojani, attorney at law and PhD candidate on migration and human rights, Greece. And joining us from Germany, uh, Victoria Ritting, head of migration program at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Hello and Willem Brunner, Head of uh, New Markets at OORS Group. It uh, stands for Organization for Refugee Services and specializes in professional services for asylum seekers in uh, different countries. So let's start with you, Willem, a uh, short introduction, introduction, and then the other speakers will also have the opportunity to, uh, to do a short introduction, and we will proceed with the discussion. Thank you very much for having me and good afternoon to hopefully sunny Athens. My name is Wilhelm Brunner. I have been 17 years in the field of migration and um, work for a company you already mentioned, ORS Group, based in Switzerland, but also active in Germany, Austria and Italy. We are specialized on all kinds of refugee services from social services to catering, transportation, um, as well as clothing. Thank you. So, um, Victoria, the floor is yours for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you also very much for having me. My name is Victoria Rittig. I lead the migration program at the German Council on Foreign Relations. We are a think tank based in Berlin and the migration program focuses on all aspects of migration policy, so both issues of migration management, including Frontex, which a lot of the speakers in earlier sessions spoke about, but also other areas such as migration, communication, asylum, and refugee issues. I'll leave it there. And uh, Myra, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for having me sit here. Um, I am um, a lawyer. I'm a um, um, uh, involved with uh, the refugee issue and the migration issue for some years now. And uh, now through my capacity of uh, a PhD researcher, uh, I um, try to focus on the issues of uh, refugees. That are, we think that is uh, very important, that is something that is going to stay in, uh, well, in Europe we have for the last decade, but uh, um, it's uh, a very important issue that we all have to realize uh, it's a profound nature and that we need to do things about it in the European and at the national level. Um, being all experts in migration and um, asylum, uh, do you see any qualitative differences, any new trends lately uh, in Europe regarding the flows, the um, uh, countries um, the, of origin? anything. So, um, do you want to start? Okay. Uh, yes, we realize that the flows uh, are changing nature through the years. I mean, uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, after 2014, it was more after the Arab Spring situation that uh, we had more of uh, uh, refugees from Syria. Now we see that the nature is different and also the quantity. I mean, uh, in Greece, uh, for the last two years, we have a uh, reduction of the flows, a significantly um, reduction of the flows. We had for the last two, to the, the first uh, um, four months of uh, 2021, we have only 2,500 people coming to Greece and a uh, reduction of 73% uh, of, um, of the flows of the past year. So yes, it's a big change, but we do not, uh, uh, we shouldn't be calm about it because uh, refugees think that uh, can, uh, the, the flows can become much bigger at any moment. We have the, the, the Turkey that uh, have the flows there that can be at any moment. So, and um, from Germany, what is the view? 
Victoria. Do you see, do you see any um, significant uh, changes in the trends of migration flows? Um, sure. I mean, we've, we've seen the changes in the flows that are coming to Europe and then within Europe we also see changes in the secondary migration. We also heard that in the exchange between Stefan Maia and the Greek Migration Minister just earlier. So definitely we see the changes of how the flows themselves have shifted. But to be frank, one has to say that we haven't really found adequate responses to this changing flow so far. The EU-Turkey statement is in dire need of being upgraded. That was also mentioned by some of the prior speakers. Um, and I think the attempt of the new pact on migration and asylum is, as Commissioner Johansson said, definitely a valiant attempt that is trying to bring all the interests together. But I am still quite doubtful in how far really the fixes that the new pact is proposing is actually going to find a way of reacting appropriately to these many new challenges. And I think we've seen that in the quite interesting exchange again between Stefan Maia and the Greek migration minister when they debated what really is solidarity and, you know, the different ideas of, of what would be a useful form of solidarity. And the big danger and the big fear, I think, and I'll end there, is that the system of flexible solidarity proposed by the new pact simply won't cut it for some member states, and Greece, of course, is one of them. And do you, Willem, do you notice any changes in the demand for uh, services for refugees? If I um, just refer to Austria, I think everything is back to normal. We have the average numbers uh, that we used to have before uh, 2015. But um, if I look back the 17 years of being in this field, it's just changing the locations and uh, some side effects of the topics. We heard that uh, 2,000 arrivals just uh, came to Lampedusa the last two days. Four, six weeks ago, we heard thousands of refugees to arrive on the Canary Islands. Now, if you have long and been enough in this um, area, you know that the Canary Islands used to be a very, very hot arrival destination for refugees from Central and West Africa 10 to 15 years ago. So it keeps like everything's back to normal, normal meaning, uh, shifting strategies, uh, never ever be ready and prepared for the, certain, the uncertain um, unexpected inflows um, and um, different countries with external borders of the European Union are exposed uh, from time to time. And I completely agree with my colleague from Greece who says we need to be prepared. We shouldn't take uh, a calm period in Greece for granted and think it's never gonna come again. It will and preparations should be uh, coming forward and, and in place to be better prepared for the next inflow. How close are we to a common European asylum and uh, immigration policy? Do you have any idea? Because uh, it's been years we're, we're uh, trying to have this agreement, but it's always elusive. This is a very, very good question and a very difficult question also. Um, I think that the proposal that the Commission made in the 23rd of September uh, 2020 uh, on the Pact on Migration and Asylum is a very ambitious approach, a holistic approach on migration and asylum. And I think that is a proposal that can, that can create a common European asylum policy. Uh, there are elements, though, that need to be considered, like uh, solidarity. Uh, Victoria mentioned before so solidarity, but uh, reading the proposal, uh, we see that uh, uh, the, the responsibilities that uh, are um, given to the first entry uh, countries are very strict and uh, very uh, well described, while, while uh, solidarity is a little bit more vague. So I think uh, um, it's a point that we need to see, that uh, we need to elaborate more. Um, countries of first entry, it's very difficult to have all the burden. We need an equal burden sharing uh, in uh, the whole uh, approach of uh, migration and asylum policy. And I think this will be the way to actually have one common European policy for everybody to, to understand that we are all in this together and we need to have a common approach. But all countries and member states need to realize that. 
Uh, how optimistic are you, Victoria, that we can reach uh, common, uh, an agreement for a common uh, European policy if new issues keep coming, keep popping up, like the secondary flows? Um, a, sh uh, a little uh, while ago, there was a very heated discussion between the Greek uh, and the German ministers, uh, Mi Mr. Mitaraki and Mr. Mayer. Uh, if Germany and Greece, who are not entirely on opposite sides, cannot agree, how can we hope that we will ever agree between the 27 member states? Exactly. And I think the answer to that is that it's not very likely that we are going to come to an agreement in the at least not near or medium term future on all aspects of migration and asylum policy. It hasn't worked in the 20 years that the system has existed on paper and it's not likely going to shift majorly in the future. But what we can hope to see are more coalitions of some member states whose, um, whose views on migration, also interests on migration, simply coalesce a little more. And I do think that Germany and Greece do have certainly a lot of interests that they share um, and that other member states in the European Union share to a much lesser degree. But I want to make one point though. Um, I think when we look at our migration debate in Europe right now, and especially in Germany, the big hot button issue everyone talks about is Frontex. And of course, we've talked about that today also. And one reason why we talk so much about Frontex and the border and the external dimension is simply that we don't have the unity in the internal dimension. And because we haven't been able to make the process, the progress necessary internally, we focus on the external dimension. And that's why cooperation with third countries um, a solid border control become much more important and why Frontex has seen this huge um, increase in, in budget, in responsibilities, in tasks. In fact, we just hosted the director of Frontex, Fabrice Legere, just last week at the German Council on Foreign Relations. And one interesting takeaway from that conversation was actually that even he, among with all other participants in the meeting, agreed that we did need reforms of Frontex and of the Frontex monitoring systems simply because we have upgraded it so much and the budget has grown so much and the personnel has grown so much but the monitoring structures simply haven't kept pace and that I think was going to be a major task of the future determining how far reaching that reform of Frontex and our external border controls need to be and some people say internal changes are enough the management board processes need to be upgraded um, we need to hire the fundamental rights officers but there's plenty of voices throughout the political spectrum that say internal changes won't be enough we need external changes we need an, a watchdog we need uh, more parliamentary oversight etc and i think that is where we're going to see the debate develop in the next uh, few months and years uh, simply because, again, coming back to your question, the internal dimension, we are not really seeing a lot of movement. Uh, part of the internal dimension is also the, um, the uh, different views of, on Frontex, the pushbacks. There is this widespread uh, view among part of the population that pushbacks um, are welcome in reality. They are just um, criticized uh, uh, at the public uh, level, but uh, in reality they are welcome and tolerated. We, what is your view on this? Uh, do you want to start, uh, Willem? Yes. Um, I believe that it is um, quite um, common practice in all of the uh, EU member states to have some sort of a pushback. You can name it differently, frame it differently, but every country, every defense system mechanism is there to uh, send people back, to don't allow them to um, file a complaint against the decision and so forth. Uh, we face a rather shift to the right in the European Union. More and more member states are making it more and more difficult uh, to apply for asylum or uh, to be granted asylum. That's uh, the fact. Um, I believe that um, every member state knows the limits. Sometimes those limits are being pushed. And it is important that uh, independent monitoring takes place and has its place and makes sure um, that um, the, the emphasis 
um, of, um, of uh, European common law and ground uh, stays intact and in place. I do hope and I do wish that uh, certain pushbacks are only uh, human errors, not systematic uh, activities of any of the member states. And uh, don't call me naive, but I still want to have that wish. Thank you. Very true, because there are even reports that Malta is pushing back uh, uh, prospective migrants to Libya, but also pushing them further on to Italy. So every country does do what they can in order to reduce numbers, it seems. Um, the uh, discussion in, in certain countries, especially France, and at the European level also, uh, there is an ongoing discussion about our way of life, the European secular way of life, versus, the, versus multiculturalism, and diversity. What are your thoughts on this point? Is the European way of life under threat and we need to, uh, to do more to preserve it or uh, not? Um, I think that uh, the European way of life uh, needs to be protected anyway. I don't think it is under threat, but it's, uh, our values are uh, values that we have uh, worked for and uh, we have uh, multiculturalism also in EU, different, uh, with common um, ideas, but in a way. Uh, so I think that uh, we need to preserve that. And in a way, the uh, external dimension of uh, the migration policy that EU is uh, planning uh, to do right now is a way to uh, present that, to, to keep this, uh, uh, our ideas and our culture. And I think that the uh, EU understands that uh, we need to focus on the, pro the problem of migration also at its root, to address it at its root. And to say that uh, we need to help those countries, to uh, help the people to stay at their homes, to um, uh, address the problems that are making, making them leave their homes and uh, uh, risk their lives to come to another country. This, with uh, an effective uh, um, return, to, uh, return policy with these countries, agreements of policy with these countries, can uh, help very much in the whole uh, management of migration. And it's a very important issue. And this is why we see that in this MFF, uh, this the budget that was voted in 2127 uh, for uh, EU, uh, most of the budget, is much bigger budget, is going to the external dimension of migration than the internal uh, mig uh, management on migration. Uh, internal management, I think it's something like 22.7 million, and uh, uh, for the world and the aid, it's 98.4. Uh, it's a big uh, difference. In Germany, is there such a discussion, Victoria? Because it was the president of uh, the Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who introduced the concept of the European way of life and the need to preserve it or do something about it, at least. Yeah, certainly. And there definitely is a debate about the European way of life, quote unquote, being under threat. And I think Yes, European way of life is under threat. I just would say that it's not necessarily under threat from migration or migrants, but it is under threat from inside of Europe and also from outside of Europe by the countries that are on the rise right now geopolitically. Um, the European way of life includes liberal democracy, it includes equality, it includes chances for everyone independently of background. And all of these things, of course, are under threat in Europe and worldwide, but again, not so much from migration. But if you're asking about diversity, let me just add this one point that I think that, of course, the concept of multiculturalism has gotten a bad reputation by now for various reasons, for botched policies in the past, especially integration policies. But there has been some learning on that. And I think the situation that we see today is clearly visible in the numbers. When you look at the numbers, when you ask people, do you think that migration is more of a good thing or a bad thing for your country? You see still that in many countries of Europe, majority of people still say, yes, migration makes our country stronger, but it needs to be well managed. It needs to be orderly. It needs to be safe. So there is no, 
you can simultaneously be pro-migration, but very worried about the borders and about the way that they are managed right now. And Willem, a very short comment from you. Uh, how do you address these uh, issues when you manage uh, uh, the refugee uh, facilities, apart from the uh, sleeping and the eating uh, provisions? Do you have any other, uh, any other, any other services on this um, issue? The critical issue here is the capacity for accommodation that needs to be hold even if you don't have the intakes and that's usually something provided by the governments. The key issue for us actually is high flexibility. High flexibility meaning that we have a system in place knowing how to welcome, how to feed, how to provide certain services and then multiply them in a crisis so that you don't um, face uh, human tragedies. That's the key issue, uh, utmost flexibility provided by experience and the system that's in place. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It was a pleasure discussing this issue, which is always very interesting and always uh, ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much.